Mike can have his own table. table. It's like, I'll zoom in. I'll zoom in. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm trying, you know, I'm going to start right at 530. I'm just going to just, that's just going to go. It's like eight seconds away. Exactly. Precision is everything. Right? <laughs> I refuse it. All right, it's 5.30, let's call the meeting to order. You guys will join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Uh, to discuss a legal issue. Um, we will reconvene in roughly at roughly 6 p.m.
for the notes. Okay, perfect. Well, we nailed it. It's 610. We're going to call the meeting back to order. Uh, okay, so our meeting tonight is a study session revolving the levy discussion and planning. Uh, anyway, uh, I believe Vic is going to hold our hands through this process as well, Tracy, and make sure we're <laughs> yes. going down this road directly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, Vic and I have uh, been meeting and uh, working together, so we're going to sort of co-share um, some information. And then really the purpose of this study session is to provide the board with information and have the board discuss and um, provide direction for uh, us moving forward for planning and um, development potentially of a resolution to bring before the board. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes just recapping for everybody really briefly uh, where we are. Uh, highlight some of the um, community polling feedback that uh, we received over the summer. We'll talk about that more, board has those full reports. Uh, Vic and I will touch on budget and enrollment information bring everybody up to speed on where we are and why we need a levy in 2023. And then um, present to the board a couple of what we're sort of calling bookend scenarios for levy, uh, including amounts, rates, use of funding, and the length and timing of the levy and what we're recommending. Um, we'll look at a timeline for next steps, but as I said, we're gonna present information and then there's lots of time for board discussion and direction. So just to recap, we all know that we um, attempted levies in 2022. Uh, just a quick reminder on how school funding works and how levies play into that uh, school funding model in our state. Uh, typically, uh, schools, all schools in Washington state receive federal funding that's funding that's really earmarked for special programs. There's different types of title funding nutrition services funding. That's funding that comes in um, from the federal government to the state, to the district, and it's allocated and earmarked for specific uses, can't be used for other things. ESSER funding, we're gonna talk more about that as we go tonight, but we all know that that ESSER funding that um, has been allocated for districts to tap into is one-time funding uh, that was part of the COVID relief package from federal government. There's state funding. That's the funding that we get based on enrollment. And so we are gonna talk a little bit about enrollment um, today and what's funded through basic education, that definition of 180 days uh, of instruction. And there's a prototypical staffing model that drives um, an allocation of funding to districts and then districts determine um, how to best use that funding. There's some parameters on that prototypical model. Some of that's earmarked, but there's a lot of flexibility within that model. Um, and then, of course, we get special education funding and CTE funding. And then uh, part of this funding formula for schools in our state is a reliance on local funding. So that's the funding that districts receive from uh, the community. And uh, measures are put before voters on a somewhat regular basis. Uh, just a reminder, when a bond goes out, those bonds are for buildings. We passed the bond in 2018. Uh, we're completed the projects at uh, Mayakin and Southridge and Kennewick and now Ridgeview and all of that was voter approved funding for um, capital projects. And then levies really focus on learning and there's a couple types of levies. There's an educational programs and operations levy and capital levy. We ran both in 2022 in February. We passed the capital tech levy. We didn't pass the EPNO levy. We tried again in April and again, didn't pass the levy in April. So uh, in um, April, just a quick reminder, we might wanna to refer to this later, but this is um, what we put out to voters in terms of 
what we were asking for and what the money is used for. So this is really right from uh, uh, the website. It equals about $31.7 million, but that includes both the levy portion and the LEA portion. So when you've got a district that doesn't have as high of a property valuation district wide as you do in other areas of the state, you receive what's called local effort assistance. And so for us, it was about $20 million of uh, levy and about $14 million of LEA. If you don't pass the levy, you don't get that additional state funding. So just a couple other pieces of data that might be helpful for us. This is a historical look. We, we maintain this on the district website so people can see it. Um, it gives you a history back from 1986 to present uh, in terms of the measures that we've run here in Kennewick uh, and um, whether or not those measures passed and what the percent yes vote was. For levies, you have to have 50% voter approval to pass. For bonds, you need 60% voter approval. So we've had a, a long, strong history of voter approval for our, for our measures. Um, until 2022 <laughs> and a couple blips along the way, but um, just wanted to share again those results. So how did we fare back in 2022 and how did we compare um, to our neighboring districts? Um, you can see in Benton County, uh, none of the EPNO levies passed in February. So Finley went out, Kennewick went out, Prosser went out, none of those levies passed. We did pass our tech levy um, Richland, I'm sorry, it's, I shouldn't have said it that way. It's not all the districts in Benton County. Richland did pass their EP&O levy um, at 54%. And then in Franklin County, um, the levies passed at a higher percent. Our nearest neighbor there, um, Pasco, they passed it a little over 54% too. Um, pretty much statewide though, all of the all of the passage rates were quite a bit lower than they had been historically this last time around in 2022. So when we ran again in April, we went out again along with Finley, Kennewick, or excuse me, Finley and Prosser because um, they didn't pass in February either. In April, um, Prosser was able to get theirs passed at just over 51%, but um, Finley and, and um, Kennewick still didn't pass. So where does that leave us? Um, and the board knows because we had lots of budget discussions and budget reduction discussions um, back prior to the end of last school year. But just to recap, we lost 34 million in revenue for school years 22, 23, and 23, 24. So it can get a little confusing because you have to remember when the measure is run and when the dollars are collected. And so um, we're still collecting right now part of <laughs> the previous levy that passed. So the funding doesn't exactly measure up or line up with when the measure went out. Um, so we lost that 20 million in levy and that 14 in um, LEA. Um, so for the 22-23 budget, the current budget that was passed by the board in June, the revenue loss is 20 million. For the 22-23 budget, um, we managed that by making some cuts. So uh, we made 3 million in staff related cuts, savings, and 2 million in non-staff um, MSOC cuts. Um, some of the reductions are really savings by not filling vacant positions, so budgeted positions that aren't being filled right now. And then some were um, reducing the position and having it come out of the budget entirely. And then um, the non-staff costs came out of the budget. For example, the curriculum adoption dollars is a big chunk of that non-staff cost. So we're not doing a curriculum adoption this year. Typically, there's about a million dollars budgeted for curriculum adoption so we can have those materials up to date for our students and teachers. So we managed it through budget reductions and savings and then using 10 million of those one time ESSER COVID relief dollars and using 15 million of existing fund balance. Both the ESSER dollars and the fund balance are, are not revenue streams, right? They're like one time funds that we can tap into. 
um, to help get us through, but it's not an ongoing revenue stream that you can keep going back to in the long term. And how that ends up at the end of the year, they may not be paying 15 out of it. It could be different based on how they manage the budget. So um, I won't go through all of this, but just to, um, in case we reference it later, uh, most of our staff cost reductions for this current year budget were accomplished by not filling positions. We had like people retire and we didn't fill their budgeted position or we had people retire and we, you know, like eliminated that position. So we were fortunate that we didn't have to do reduction in force. We didn't have to issue RIF notices to people and people, you know, lost their jobs. But we are still operating with fewer people than we did previously. So the next couple of pages um, of the of the presentation just outline again what those staff related reductions were and I won't go through them all but um, I just wanted to remind you all what was in that budget that was presented and adopted in June. So there's some here and then some additional ones here. So categories really in all staff areas from administration to maintenance and operations to teaching to secretarial staff to warehouse and um, custodial IT kind of all, all across the board. And then um, here's a summary of those um, MSOC, the non-staff related costs and, and what was um, reduced there. And again, the big one is that curriculum adoption budget. So that's just highlighting again, kind of bringing us up to where we are. <laughs> um, and then, so what one thing we wanted to do is to get some additional information um, about like community perceptions and um, messaging and things that might help us in help inform planning for future levy. So you uh, um, have received the big full reports uh, from the polling that we had done. Tonight I'm just highlighting a few things that will you know lead into the planning discussion moving forward so just as a reminder this was not like a district survey that we did we do district surveys often we do the annual family survey do the annual student survey annual staff survey but this was different in that it, it's a mixed mode they call it a survey it's really um a polling that they do um, of and this is a company that does this professionally it's statistically um, valid they find a representative sample of the community and they talk to people um, by phone or people could complete this process electronically so you can see there's a margin of error um, you know a slight margin of error but a 95 percent confidence level and you know they really account for um, looking at the full demographics and like diversity of our community to ensure that that they're talking to a good um, cross section of the community when they do this process. So the just a big kind of overview, um, what, what was learned through this process is that residents are largely satisfied with the quality of education in the district. They look at both um, non-parents and um, parents who have students in the district. Um, the residents rated the district highly on a number of metrics, including maintaining schools and facilities. And again, I think that speaks to the community um, support for the bond and our ability to uh, get those, you know, facilities replaced and rebuilt when they're um, needed. Also, keeping students safe and providing high quality teaching all leaned on the, the positive side. Um, there's a real mix about whether people think that schools need additional funding or the district needs additional funding. Uh, just under half say the district needs additional funding and 21%, only 21% said they definitely think the district needs additional funding. Tax sensitivity is definitely a factor. Um, I mean, we, we know that this is not an easy economic time for people and um, 53% of residents indicated that, you know, ta they feel taxes are too high um, and 29% saying taxes are much too high. And I think that's taxes like just across the board, not just specific um, to us, but it certainly um, is a factor for us. 
When it comes to what are funding priorities, the rank order um, was really uh, looking at academic programs and safety items, including school resource officers, nurses, counselors, and mental health supports coming up at the top of the list, while extracurricular activities and athletics were um, rated a little bit lower when it comes to priorities for funding. Um, the reality is that levy funds all of those things, right? Um, so this just shows you a breakdown of that last bullet point um, that kind of shows the top priority. You can see that people, this is a little hard to see on the screen, but it says top priority and high priority. So, um, you know, 58% of people said this is a high priority. Again, you know, 48% said athletics and activities are high priority as well. But then the, the darker shaded blue shows when, where people indicated that area was a top priority. And then um, another uh, thing that was asked, which is just um, interesting for us when it comes to how do we get our message out to people? And that was something you remember we really talked about between the February and the April <laughs> measures is how do we get information out to people, accurate information out to people? How do we engage the community about the need for the levy funding, where the dollars go? We held some of those in-person um, sessions that weren't well attended. Um, <laughs> and so this is just inform good information for us moving forward about where people are saying they get their information. And then this is just a breakdown between because, of course, we're talking about voters in general in the community registered voters. And we've got people who have children in our schools and people who don't. And so there's a little bit of a difference here between where um, parents say their top sources of information about the district, where they get their information versus where non parents get their information. So it's helpful for us to know as we think about moving forward. OK, so I'm um, going to just keep rolling, but you know, stop at any time. I, um, we'll just kind of get through some of the information presentation and then there'll be lots of discussion. We can go back to anything that you want in the in the PowerPoint slides. Um, so, you know, we already highlighted the budget impact of the levy failure and um, what that looks like for this current year and for next year. So it's 20 million this year, 14 million next year. Um, I just wanted to point out that like that doesn't it doesn't mean that this year is the 20 million in levy and next year is the 20 million in LEA. It it just worked out that way. So do you want to? Uh, yeah, that's uh, correct. And then, you know, we're not, we, we uh, have been working the budget uh, last spring. You know, we expect to have a, Okay, um, so for the 2023 budget, when we're planning ahead for that, with the levy, so if we assume that we have a levy in 2023, um, the budget will need, we're still going to need to use 10 to $15 million of the ESSER funds. Um, So that's just part of our equation now is using those ESSER funds to backfill because of the levy failure. Um, those those ESSER funds won't be around forever. They expire September 2024. And um, it's just a good reminder. We don't have those right now, like sitting in the bank. Those are um, things we have to. Right. Yeah, we have to, uh, uh, I, I don't know if apply for yeah. is the seek reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we about $10 million. So, is that to be encumbered by September 2024 or you have to be used by? Then we have to be Like, I promise that I'm going to be using that. And then um, the plan for next year may also. Um, continue to um, have us using some existing fund balance. And so that's even with a levy. Um, with, without a levy isn't really an option. <laughs> um, we would 
need to make about $10 million of additional budget cuts. And we know how hard it was to, to, to make those cuts last time around, or even talk about making some of those cuts. Um, this time around, it would be not just not filling unfilled position. It would be reduction in force. It would be, it would be, I mean, ten million dollars is a lot to cut. Um, we've already, you know, created some efficiencies by the cuts that we made um, last year. Some of those are things that we're not necessarily going to just automatically put back. We want to be really strategic and thoughtful about. Um, you know, restoring any kind of cuts that we've made um, if we don't need to. But without a levy, we couldn't even consider restoring some of those things. Those unfilled positions of, of people, that curriculum <laughs> adoption, we wouldn't be able to restore those things without a levy. So it's really not an option. I mean, levy funding is just part of our um, part of our revenue stream and right now we are factoring in ESSER dollars as part of that so we are you know we want to use those ESSER dollars that are available um, to the to the best degree possible but we just have to remember that that's one-time money just like the fund balance is one-time money when we planned the levy before we never expected 10 to 15 million dollars of ESSER uh, a year ago So I'm not remembering exactly all of the areas that we chose to use those SR dollars, but obviously that money will be gone. Then those programs or staff or whatever will then not be funded either. Well, the, the, with the levy, those, those staff is being funded by our small current staff. They can right. But without a, without a levy, then those things would additionally be gone. Is uh, that correct? Yeah. yeah. So kind of double. And I'm not being a very good role model, um, but I'm going to just remind everybody that um, for the people to hear at home who might be listening on Zoom and maybe even for some of the people here in the room, it's good for us to be closer to the mic so everybody can can hear. So. Um, so, you know, when we talk about like levy funded staffing, just like I showed you on that um, first slide, we do, you know, spend levy dollars to help fund staff positions. And uh, earlier I mentioned that prototypical um, staffing model that shows what we receive from the state in certain categories of staffing. So that's what is shown here. And then what we have in our district budget and what you could consider the state funded cost versus the district funded cost. And our district's not unique in this area. Uh, we have more needs that are funded from the state. And so we supplement those basic education needs and the prototypical staffing model with levy dollars. Do you want to add anything there? Um, so there's you know, various ways of looking at you know, what's local funded. In this chart here it says there's $30 million. That is your levy, levy utilization that you consider using that money for that. You add in your overload pay and a bunch of other pay that's not on there. That's another say, $10 million. So then you get to $40 million. Um, you know, our levy and levy utilization is like $34 million. We run about a $5 million deficit normally. That's how that math kind of looks. So again, it's just to kind of highlight that if we um, if we didn't have levy dollars, we would have to make pretty significant staffing reductions, like cut positions. Um, the other thing that was mentioned earlier, right, is that for our state funding revenue stream, that's based on enrollment. And so we wanted to just give you a little preview and we'll do a, be, a, a more comprehensive enrollment report at the upcoming October meeting. But as we look at our preliminary numbers for September and the September count, um, the first couple of bullets are just reminding you how the, um, how the funding works. It's enrollment driven and they look at the average student FTE over a 10 month period from September to June. 
and that's how we get our state funding. So uh, just like we've been looking at student achievement data, pre-COVID, post-COVID, and those kind of things, we're looking at enrollment, pre-COVID, post-COVID, to kind of get a sense of, of, of where we are. So um, K-12, if you look at FTE, full-time equivalent um, enrollment, that's how we get our funding. So for example, if you're a high school student and you're enrolled in some classes at the high school and you're taking some running start classes, you might be like 0.8 FTE at your high school and 0.2 running start. So the FTE gets allocated that way. Or if you're, you know, participating in TriTech, you might be 0.5, I'm just making up numbers, FTE at your high school and 0.5 TriTech. So FTE is how the, the funding gets driven. Um, we're down um, 233 students when you compare where we are now compared to 2019 before COVID. So that's um, 18.389 to 18.156, and we've got a chart on the next slide. Headcount, so if you count like that student, while the student might be, you know, partial FTE, they're one student, it's one body. So headcount's a different way of looking at enrollment. And um, for, for headcount, we're only down 150, or excuse me, 146 students. So we're really seeing um, some of that drop in enrollment that was likely due to COVID come back. And I think it's also interesting that we compare kind of what was the trend pre-COVID to what is the trend we're seeing now. So we, for a number of years prior to 2019, we were seeing some pretty significant growth in enrollment and then it was starting to plateau and flatten out. So when you look at 2018 to 19, FTE, student enrollment FTE only grew by 29. It's really, really flat. Um, and headcount declined by 84. So our numbers aren't that different right now when you look at sort of the trends pre-COVID to now. Is that making sense? So it just gives us a sense of what we might be able to anticipate um, moving forward with enrollment. And this um, is just that data all laid out by level. <laughs> um, the top part is FTE trend and the bottom part is headcount trend. Okay, so that's just a whole bunch of kind of background information, uh, reminders, enrollments, all of those kind of things. Before we get into some of our thinking um, that we want to share with you about scenarios for moving forward, was there anything that you want to talk about in kind of the data and information? Do you have questions? I mean, I have questions. I just don't know. Do you want to go through them now or do you want to go through this and talk at the end? Or what, what do you want? However you guys want to do it. Well, well here's a question. What are your are your questions regarding the information you saw or just the levy in general? No, it's just interesting stuff. Okay. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's go ahead. Um, so my first question is regarding the survey that we did. So we did a survey this summer. We had 400 people surveyed through the district. What did this survey what did this survey tell us? Like what was the overall? I, I guess I, I thought the survey was going to tell us why people essentially voted no. And I don't think any of that was in here. Yeah, so we had 80, roughly 8,200 people voted no. But like from this, where, where do we what do we tackle to show those people that we've made changes or, or done some of those things? I just didn't see that in the survey. Yeah, so, so the purpose is community perception um, survey. So the purpose of the survey was to find out what are, what, are, what, are the, what are the community's perceptions about public education, about public funding, specifically in Kennewick, that would help inform moving forward and what messaging you know, what's helpful messaging, what's not helpful messaging. So it really wasn't a why did you vote no survey. We They also did do, as you guys received, mm -hmm. the kind of demographic analysis to, to so we can look at um, voting patterns and um, and those kind of things. But it, it wasn't a, I mean, that wasn't a question. Why did you vote no? Yeah. 
Yeah, because I saw the conclusion. I, I mean, I read through the conclusions and stuff. I guess I just maybe I misunderstood. I I mean, this is great data, but it's to me, it doesn't really hit. I guess where I would be looking for on how, how do we get how do we communicate with the 80 200 ish people that voted no, right? I mean, we I think we failed the levy by about 300 people each time. So I guess my my initial thought was we're going to be able to say, hey, these are your top five or six issues as to why you voted against the levy and these are the changes we've made. I, I guess that's that's what I thought we were doing. So, so maybe I misunderstood okay. that, but I just didn't this didn't give me any of that information. So okay. I guess I'm not. So I'm going to jump in here real quick if that's all right. So because I, I was kind of thinking some of the same, same thing, but going through, I guess there's a lot, couple ways to look at it. Because again, to your point, we have to go back. What do we what do we do wrong? How do we, and, and what's our message going mm -hmm. forward? Because obviously there's something in our message that didn't resonate. Right. And and so we've got, I think we've really got to come up with a direction of, of what are we trying to do? How are we going to do it? How are we going to show the community that, hey, we learned a lesson? We did something wrong here that you did not like. How do we go forward with this in a, in a manner that is, you know, palatable, fiscally responsible, and says, "Hey, look, we hear you, but we still need your support." Is is this a better program? I also like the you know the information. I spent some time going through the the, the, the demographic data, which I was fast was thought it was fascinating. So it really broke it down by how did each area vote and why and and, and what are the demographics of that. Because again, I think there's a lot of areas where we have continued support. And so now we need to go to those areas and say, look, we need to go, you know, Creekstone. You know, Creekstone supported it, but, you know, can we find a couple hundred more votes there? Or, you know, some of these different areas that we, sh we should try and find a way to go really, you know, hit those doors and say, hey, how do we get your support? What do we, what do we need to hear from you? Because we have time to do that. Right. And so I think that, that that data gives us a good idea about how we should go forward and, and who do we who do we need to go, you know, again, basically knock on the door and say, hey, what do we do wrong? How do we win this back? Yeah. Yeah. I no, I I like the data. I just again I, I thought in my brain we were gonna get reasons why and we were gonna be able to say, okay, we we've corrected this, we've corrected this, we've corrected this, we need to message this this better. But um, so yeah, so I, I guess maybe I just misunderstood the the survey. Um, a little bit, but um, hopefully we can take that information like you were talking about. Um, we know the areas, I guess, to go to, but we still have to go figure out why. My feedback, my feedback was kind of like re reading those summaries. I felt like, yeah, that's the same thing that I heard, that we have kind of been talking about, right? And and so, um, to me, it seems really obvious the things we need to do, like to Mike's point, like like what things do we need to do? Well, is I feel like it's pretty obvious. I mean, we've lost there's there's one demographic we lost. And that demographic wants something and we're not obviously not singing their same song. So how can we get that demographic back? And it seems pretty obvious, right? So I think we should talk about how to get that demographic back. So I have two comments. One is 59% um, of the people said they were largely satisfied. So you can make statistics say anything you want, but 59% is not a huge group of people saying that they're largely satisfied. So who knows why they're l not, you know, that 41%. I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Not necessarily about the levy yay or nay, but what is it specifically that you are not largely satisfied. That could be minorly satisfied, I guess, but I'd like to know a little bit more about that. And then um, <coughs> there was an, another um, comment and I wrote it down and now I'm not um, finding it. But um, going through those areas, well, first of all, you have to go back 30, what was it, 34% of the people voted and that's typical. I'm looking at Pat because Pat knows all those things. So I think it was like 30 some, 34 percent voted. That's typically how how many people always vote um, for these off elections. And so once again, if you do it in February, which you know they suggest you do for multiple reasons, maybe not how do I change minds of people who may not want to change their minds, but there are just lots of people that are, dare I say, employees of our school district, neighbors of the people who live with us, parents, siblings, 
uh, my son didn't vote two times ago just because he got lazy and he didn't turn it in. So, you know, 300 votes, uh, you know, that's our neighbors, right? And and I know we've done the uh, each one talk to nine people, et cetera, et cetera. But that outreach of get people registered to vote, get people voting. How do we, um, you know, it's pretty easy to put it in your mailbox or, or wherever in the Dropbox, but how do you get people to do that and to register? Because a lot of people say, oh, I don't vote because it's not important. Well, it, it obviously was important. So um, I think we need an outreach just to get people to understand that, yes, you, you need to vote because 34 percent, and that might have even been less for a particular levy specifically. If it was 32 percent of all the people that live in Kennewick, that's pretty sad. So I think the outreach on that of just getting people to vote is super important. By the way, in Washington state, ballot harvesting is actually legal. I don't know how, but it is. But it is actually legal to to go to someone's door and actually and actually ask them it is. to vote and collect even collect their ballot and turn it in for you them. You cannot collect, but you can take from people who are your family members. Yeah, and it's, it's actually legal. It's called ballot harvesting. It sounds like you're breaking law, but it is legal. So anyway, that's, but, there's, yeah. I mean, if we no, look into that, there's there's some way. No, we're we not can, talking about taking their ballots, but just saying, please register vote. Please vote. Please get your No, I'm in. talking about actually ballot harvesting. If that's, you can. You can't do that. Yeah, yeah Diane, look it up. It's legal in Washington. Okay, let's move on here. So, so, oh, anyway, so I, I, I guess I just, I guess my final question on the survey is, how, is, is are we going to, are we going to figure out what those priorities are and, and be able to message those out? So I'll use an example. For example, I know based on my discussions and some stuff I did with the levy, passing resolute or passing policy 2340, I think put a lot of people at ease. So that's one thing that we've done that I think the community was saying, hey, we need this. We want this. This is what we think. Now we now we've done something. So that's something we can uh, that's something that we've done for those folks who potentially voted voted no. I know we've lowered the tax rate. That's another thing. So I guess I just want to make sure that those issues that are pressing the community for the reason why 3000 people voted no this time we address those and we're bound to flip four or five hundred a people. lot of people will just because we passed out that, that policy there's that there's a lot of votes right there a lot and, and if you remember in addition to this data we started with a district survey mm -hmm. that i don't think i mean it maybe just didn't say that you know why did you vote no but that remember we said we we did our own district survey that was pretty well um you know, people participated. We had a pretty good turnout for that, and it was after February, and that's when you know there was still the COVID factor and all the masks and that kind of thing, and that came out in that survey. Um, so we had that data, and then um, this data does give us some, um, you know, information about tax sensitivity mm -hmm. and some information about funding priorities and where you know where where those rank in addition to the data that we collected from our district survey and the data that you all are speaking to as elected officials as board members you've got constituents that you meet with and talk with and they're you know you you might hear all different things from different constituents but you bring that all to the table and you help use that to help you and help inform direction to give to us. So that's another really important data point. Absolutely. So I guess if you guys have any other questions, I would look to Vic and let's see, let's start looking at some of these these proposals and seeing seeing what these numbers look like going forward. I think it'd be a good idea to look at the summary from the report because I thought that was pretty telling. It's like the last page of not I don't I think it was not that one. I know it was like not this, not this report, but the other one. You know, there's like two reports you sent us. The demographic one, the kind of the yeah, recommendation. The very, yeah, the, like the so. summary at the very end. There's, mm -hmm. there's some paragraphs, and there's some bullet points and some paragraphs. Do you have that? <clears throat> okay. Do you, do you want me to? I think it's, uh, I, I think at some point it doesn't have to be right at the second, oh, but at some point we should we probably can. get to that. Okay. Finish yeah. and then come back to yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I just ask one question? So, if you, the money comes and go so if the levy passed in february of 23 
when does that kick into like the budget? Is that further? Is that the, at that school year and starting in the fall, or is that? It's 2024, I'm sorry. Collecting in 2024. So it's like so a year behind. Like 24, a little bit in 24. Okay. We still lose money from the 23 revenue. Okay. Okay. So I'll kind of click ahead here, and we'll share our best thinking. Uh, <laughs> let's see where we go. Okay. So, um, sorry, I accidentally clicked ahead. I'm having clicker issues. Here we go. Okay, so um, Vic and I have been uh, talking and meeting, looking through the data, um, looking through the financial information, and we've got a couple of scenarios um, to start with to present to the board when we're talking about amounts and rates and the use of the funding and timelines. So, uh, first of all, I think it's important to ask ourselves, right, what has changed and what hasn't changed since last time around in April? Um, what has changed is we have the final budget numbers from the state, and uh, we'll, we can touch on that for a minute. We have pr preliminary assessed valuations, and we'll highlight that. We got the information that we just talked about a little bit from the community polling, in addition to the data that was collected before that, and the data that individual board members have, and we've implemented those budget reductions and savings. Vic, do you want to just touch on the final budget numbers from the state yeah, one, and then we'll get into the assessed valuations? When the, the first uh, round of the budget was in the fall, and uh, did not have a lot of the information, so we're looking for the most case And then, um, you know, later in the spring, uh, we did the April budget, So, so overall, we got a little more state money than we were originally expecting. So, um, and this all kind of plays into then our plan moving forward, right? Um, assessed valuation was the next piece there. So, um, the assessed valuation of the district uh, is important because as the assessed valuation grows, either from new growth in the community or from people's property being assessed at a higher value. That means that we can seek a same or even a lower amount of money and have a lower tax rate. So as assessed valuations go up, right, overall net in the district, the tax rate overall goes down. So this shows the um, assessed value trend like historically in the change and what the new assessed valuation for 2022 is the preliminary numbers and again i'll let vic kind of highlight this a little bit and you can ask any questions so, so vic, before you get there vic so when we did because i know we had preliminary you, you had you were guessing what the assessed value was going to be on your on your previous yeah so we we use project Okay, so you were you were figuring seven percent, give or take. Yeah. Okay. And then you know, looking at the past history, talking to uh, did call the assessor's office, and you know, they uh, are committed to continuing to get property to market value. Uh, you know, one point five million is, is pretty significant increase. About two hundred eighty about two hundred eighty million of that is in construction. So that's you know, the past history. That's the most new construction that we have. Still, it's a big number. So most of the assessments. I got my assessment, so yes, it is. Yep. <laughs> Generally, they uh, will change different areas of town. Will get an assessment higher one year, then not so much the next year, and then they'll get another area of town. So that's why you know, when I got ten percent, you got thirty. And the next year, you know, I get twenty. Well, so that so with that assessed value, you know, 
being double what you predicted. So that should give us the ability to come in with a different levy amount. Except that's what I read. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, thought, yeah, I saw that. I just wanted to make sure we covered that. So, yep. Okay. Okay, so those are some things that have changed, and you'll mm -hmm. see how that new information then helps inform potential scenarios moving forward. I just want to highlight like what hasn't changed. Um, our, our goals have not changed. What our goals, what we're trying to do is, well, A, <laughs> and very importantly, is we want a levy plan that the board unanimously supports and approves. It's really important as uh, the elected officials um, who govern our district, uh, who are responsible for authorizing a levy resolution to go forward to voters that, that the board's, you know, 100% behind the plan, supporting it and um, approving it moving forward. Our goal is to ensure that we've got a fiscally responsible plan for both the short term and the long term that um, our plan allows us to maintain programs and staffing that we need to maintain. We want to avoid undesired budget cuts. Again, I, I, you know, we all got a little taste of what that is like <laughs> last spring, and it's it's not a fun um, situation for the board to be in or for the district to be in. And we want to continue to focus on our strategic goals for our students and be able to accomplish those goals. We do want to ensure that, and this goes with a fiscally responsible plan, we want a plan that, you know, continues to, force isn't the right word, but ensure that as a district we're looking at system efficiencies and we're implementing those. You know, we, we don't want to be wasting money. We don't want to be using more money than we need. We want to make sure that we're able to do what needs to be done, but we're also operating in an efficient way. We also, the board, this is, and this is going to come up here in just a minute, but, you know, there's times where um, we're looking to make strategic investments so we can make improvements in our system. And safety is a, a big priority. And over the past several months, I've had board members, and I think over the past many months, all board members um, ask about, are there ways that we can increase safety? Can we make some additions to safety? And the answer to that is, if we have the funds to do it, we can do those things. So with those additional, you know, people positions that help with safety, it takes resource to do that. And we can only do that if we have the resources to do it. So um, we want to be able to, to make those strategic investments when, when needed. And obviously we, we need a plan that's supported by the majority of voters. I mean, we, we would prefer to have it <laughs> supported by 100% of voters but we definitely need to meet that 50% <laughs> threshold for levies. I would just know that I think there's nothing more important than safety. So I think we should, safety should be 100%. And if we have to sacrifice another area, we do that because it doesn't matter how well you're teaching the kids if they're not alive, right? So safety's, I don't think we should ever short safety. So, um, so with that, it kind of gets into this may be a good segue. So if we if we really want to accomplish all of these goals, how much funding do we need? And that's what um, Vic and I uh, kind of put together what we're calling some uh, a bookend scenarios. Um, so scenario A is really about seeking the lowest possible amount and rate while continuing to maximize local effort assistance. It would not be fiscally responsible or wise for us to leave state funding on the table and not maximize that LEA that we receive if we can get a levy passed. So um, what that scenario looks like on the one bookend would be, we would, we would go that route. That would mean we'd need to maintain the budget reductions that are in place. We would not be able to add any new safety staffing um, or really add any new anything. Um, we'd continue to use those um, ESSER funds to help balance the budget for 23-24 and all of that would be a, where you know in order to accomplish that maximizing LEA the lowest rate really possible is the dollar fifty and we would then maintain that rate over the three years. So the dollar fifty is the formula calculation Yeah. 
kind of the other end of, of what we think is a reasonable bookend based on tax sensitivity and all of the data that we've looked at is that we seek the same levy amount as we did in April 2022, but based on those factors that have changed with assessed valuation and so forth, we can come in at a lower tax rate. This plan would also allow us to do some additional things that we think are priorities of parents and, and voters. So what in um, this scenario, we would be evaluating those budget reductions based on overall funding, and we, we might not be putting things back that were cut, um, but we might look at prioritizing, for example, the curriculum funding might al allow us to bring that funding back for curriculum and then look at bringing potential other things back if they're needed through um, other funds. For example, um, funds that we're getting from increased enrollment or additional state funding that's coming in. This scenario would also be adding some safety staff. So it would be the same amount as April. However, there'd be some additional safety things, people we would be adding, and I'll get into that in just a moment. This bookend scenario would also involve us using 10 to 15 million of ESSER funds um, and some fund balance. And the rate here um, would be starting at $1.76, and then it would decline um, over the three years. So in April, in February, the, the um, the plan put forward to voters had the rate increasing. Then when we scaled it back in April, it was still an increasing rate from year one to year two. In this scenario, the rate starts lower than it was presented in April and declines over the three years. So we'll take a look at those Can two I ask options. What's like, I'm, not saying I, I'm not saying I disagree with that. I'm just kind of wondering the logic behind having it start a little higher and then declining. It relates to the amount of money that you're seeking for each year. And so that's what's going to work. We'll show on these two slides and then we can unpack that a little bit more. So like that, that kind of first bookend scenario with the dollar fifty. Um, because of the AV projections. So you look at AV and what amount you're seeking and then that equates to a tax rate per thousand of assessed value. And it, when a AV is increasing every year, it means you can keep that tax rate at the that same level, but collect a little bit more the next year because our expenses do increase every year. So typically the levy plans that have been put forward since probably the beginning of <laughs> time, um, the amounts increase slightly by year to ensure that your expenditure and revenue stream are meeting up. And here's where Vic yeah, can talk more. <laughs> we're still using the $850 million projection. We updated the one year for the uh, one point four billion. Um, but we're still using the $850 million for the and that's uh, how the rates are changing the revenue now divided by So if we were to then put in that one point four billion or one point two billion, whatever that number is pump that in, wouldn't that allow us to offer a lower levy rate? Uh, so on this scenario here, if we were going to, you know, say we're going to use the dollar fifty and we're going to you know, up the projections, so those rates would actually, be, those levy amounts would probably need to go up because the projection is going to take the levy rate below a dollar fifty and you wouldn't get all the levy equalization. So mm -hmm. those would have to go up a little bit, probably not like the first one, maybe not. But the 2025, 2026, if you were to make sure you weren't leaving any money on the table, uh, you know, we'd have to raise those amounts <coughs> up a little bit. And then probably the, the rate would still be a dollar fifty ish in there, but you know, we definitely want to raise the money now. So you know, calculate that rate would be rolled up to dollar fifty if you can get you know your projections for the assessed value uh, came in higher than Right. Okay. Yeah, so that's the maximum amount we can ask for. Yeah, but gotcha. in that scenario, we want to make sure we, we make sure that it wasn't in the dollar fifty, so we can get all of that equalization. So those are the 
Okay, so I think that's I think that's where we're getting hung up because that's. And it might be better. The other scenario might. Yeah, let's 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 let's, let's move along. I, I think I'm getting it. because There's a part of this that I was missing. So I thought. So let's. I think it with these. Okay. Yeah. I think there's yeah. There. <clears throat> oh, do you want me to turn it back? Do you want? Okay. So so this is um, the the scenario B, where um, we'd be looking at the same amount. So right but there, the, the April 22 election, 23.375, yeah. it was estimated $1.5. And with the $1.4 billion increase, we updated that now to $1.76. But the amount is the same, still 23.375. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so, the whole, so the threshold, so what we're concerned about is if we overshoot and Overshoot the 20 million. Oh, we oversuit. Yeah, because we, yeah. cause, cause we're asking for a flat amount. Mm -hmm. So we said this much. And if yep. all of a sudden we overshoot and our levy comes in to your point of 145, dollar 45 per thousand, we no longer get the LEA because that we are below correct. our the floor, right. at which point the state will give us the right. LEA funds. That's correct. <laughs> hey, what do you know? Right. That actually, yeah, that's good. That was good. I would go back and make sure. Okay. Mike, thank you for getting that because that that that, got that it to that's yeah. that. So okay, so that's and so I think that's a that's a really important point because I think what's going on here is that when we see, because I think that also goes back to part of the the issue with with the public saying why are you guys asking for so much money, when in reality you're saying we're at, we we know we've got to hit this dollar fifty number because if we go below dollar fifty, we now lose this other you know 11 12 million bucks or 14, 14 million bucks that come from the state. Yeah. So we're asking it's like we may ask a little bit. We're asking a little more, hoping that it will come in less. So in this case, to your point, we asked for a dollar eighty-five, but would have been a dollar seventy-six. So yeah, we're well above dollar fifty. But uh, most people they don't want to see oh you estimated dollar eighty-five and gee now it's a uh, right. dollar. Right. Right. <laughs> gotcha. So that's so that's the that's the, all right. That's where we were. Yeah, you're estimating so you know you're above a dollar fifty, regardless of what where the numbers come in at. And Vic, yeah, I know that you've said this for years since you came to this district, um, that that estimated levy rate is, I don't know the right word, a nicety that we provide for the community. The The, the main thing is what the max is. And so it, that's not a written in stone amount. And I, I think that some that's goes along with that, that that's an estimate and people don't maybe always understand that part either. Uh, and not maybe, I know people don't always understand that. And so I think that's an important piece to make sure we get that information out. Right. But but to your point, but and as, as, as Gabe was bringing up, this is all about the messaging. Okay. And I think we need to say, hey, look, this is, we've got to find a clear, concise way to, to, to message that to our constituents saying, look, here's the deal. It won't be above this, but it will most likely, with any luck, it'll be below this. But here's why we have here's why we have to hit a dollar fifty in all these various scenarios. Does that, yeah, that make sense? Uh, yeah, all right. So. I think it might make sense. I'm gonna kind of go the opposite way on this just because I think I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't. How much does the levy proposed amount go up with the rate going up? Let's say 176 was 180. What, what would that proposed amount roughly look like? Ballpark. If the, yeah, 23, Feb 23 for levy or 24, if that was 180 instead of 176, what are we looking at for a proposed amount? Uh, you might be up around 24 million. Okay. That's, it's, I'm, just, I'm just curious. And I'm at, I, and, and then we can, at, this money can be allocated where we, would like to allocate it, right? So, and the reason I asked, so let's say, what if we said, okay, it's going to be 180, but every, the next three years at 180, but we're going to allocate 2.5 million a year to school safety. And that's going to provide SRO security officers, new cameras, all the security updates. Like, yeah. is that? So, so okay. what this scenario yeah, at, at this, yeah. at, at, at those yeah. numbers that are on this, at the, mm -hmm. on these amounts, right? we would be able to do these things. So, so, um, and this gets into 
the safety questions that board members have raised. Can we? Is there a way to get more SROs? Um, you know, how how can we look at having more safety in our schools? So um, what what I've done is I have had discussions with um, uh, the city manager um, at City of Kennewick because so I'll first start with the first bullet um, about um, SROs. So right now we have school resource officers at our high schools and some of our middle schools. Um, in talking with city manager, uh, mostly they're also looking at wanting to, you know, because that's a shared program, right? We we pay half, city of Kennewick pays half, and um, so they're looking to add their share of the funding in their biennial budget, and our share of that would be about about two hundred fifty five thousand dollars. So we that is included factored into that levy amount scenario B to make that addition um, and that that would give us um, SROs at all of our middle schools and high schools. Then the question has come up about elementary schools and is there something that we could do for elementary schools and there's been you know ideas that board members have shared so did a little more conversation and research on that um, both with the city manager and also with Chief Guerrero to ask some questions and things like that and um, an idea that we could fund it's about it costs us about a million dollars um, would be to um, hire retired police officers and they're out there and the KPD says they're out there and in fact some of them work for us right now in different um, different uh, positions but um, we could partner with the city of Kennewick and so they that partnership would look like they would you know help us find the people they would make sure they're they're sort of like training they would help with the training and that kind of thing to hire what uh, what we they would be limited commission officers so i'm just calling them limited commission safety officers they they would be armed um they would be trained they are retired police officers um but they're not the same as a commit fully commissioned police officer and so um, this would be a job that would potentially be attractive for a, a retired police officer. Um, you know, they would still be able to like retire from their system and work for us in this capacity, serving as safety officers at our elementary schools. Um, and, and so that would be a million dollars. So both of these things are factored into that scenario B. Could could we also do these limited commission officers um, and help supplement like a, like the high school? So there's two, like an SRO and a limited commission officer in the high school. Well, I'm just curious. Yeah. I'm just asking the question. It just takes oh, money. <laughs> no, no, I know. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. If we and kind of to the messaging, right? Safety is important. So if we're gonna like we put the money into it and we tell folks this is where your money you know this is where it's going for sure like we're going to commit this money to that i think that's you know a reasonable ask i mean at this point i don't i wouldn't be surprised if you know there was a lot of people who voted against some of the safety things we want to do but got to message it and i would almost rather have two at a high school and none at an elementary school almost because it seems like that's yeah, I'll just happen. say, you know, I do get questions from um, elementary families about, you know, so what, so it's great that you have SROs or, um, you know, people at the middle and high schools, but what about elementary? Um, so, I mean, I think, I think having somebody at all schools and then potentially looking to, you Double know, add with, add at more levels is, is not a bad idea. I just, you know, I feel like maybe a starting point would be doing something for at all levels where right. there isn't somebody and then it's just a matter of as we go through this like what you know Vic and I spent a lot of time trying to really look at that you know there is a, a, a tax sensitivity part of this there is a reality of you know um, the current economic <laughs> condition and you know but but could we do this we could fund these things with this plan okay one more question could we also set up a very very rigorous training that is difficult to pass but if one passes it a teacher could carry in school that's i mean a, i know we a, could but that's a, i'm not sure that's a levy question right that's something we can talk about talk about another it's a safety time. question and safety is a levy issue 
maybe. I, 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 I think that's that's a conversation for another, for another day. Um, yeah. So it's. Uh, I'll, I will tell you what I've been researching is this, not not that question. So I've been researching the question because what was asked is, can we have more SROs or are there any creative ways to get, you know, essentially police officers, you know, people who this is what they do um, and, you know, have them some some form of a police officer at the elementary school. So that's the but research why? that I've why, done. But why are you doing that research? Because, because I was asked was to asked by board members. To, yeah. But and why? For safety. Exactly. So what I'm saying is, you guys are dismissing this as if it's off topic, and it's not off topic. It's perfectly on topic. You, the ultimate thing is safety that we're talking about here. So I'm talking about it's safer when you have more SRO officers in schools, and it's safer if if I'm carrying a gun right now. It's safer if somebody comes in here and I can protect people, right? And I have Except that training. Except it's illegal for you yeah, to be carrying the gun right now. <laughs> right, but if but what I'm saying is if if we had that training, that would allow that. I, Mike, I think that the, I'm not, I'm not trying to be dismissive. I think that what I'm what my my statement on that is is if we want to talk about that, that is something that the board needs to discuss and come up and say, look, we we want to allow our teachers to carry, but that is something that we're all going to have to sit around and talk about. And, and we're going to have to agree to that before we can put something like that in the budget. But again, and that's it's free. Can <clears throat> I'd like to say something, Micah, when you talked about um, not having at elementary schools. So the original mission of SROs was to do student outreach and, and to um, get students to feel, um, to understand that officers are not always bad people. Right. right. So it comes from that. Unfortunately, because of things that have happened, they've become more of a police officer within a, in a school. So um, places, there are places that do use those retired officers and where they are at elementary schools or where there are security people, not commissioned police officers, that's the whole idea is um, they run small groups, they have kids come for lunch, they do different things that build um, behavioral kinds of opportunities for kids. So having them at the elementary school, it's just like- um, It's more than safety. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm using math, like early math studies, early reading, you know, intervention does good things. So early activities with people that help our littlest people learn how to treat other people kindly and safely and respectfully um, are very valuable. So um, having, um, people in our buildings that can help our, um, we're talking about SEL, so our, you know, group of people that we're working with on that. Um, just had a conversation when we were having pizza earlier. Uh, we have uh, the people I call our littles, so our three to five year olds, six and seven year olds are attacking teachers. They're attacking other students um, in our schools and that happens frequently. So we have little people who need help learning those things so that by the time they're 12, 13 and 14, as one of my ex students happened last week, they don't get shot. Yeah, I don't that's want, actually a good you know, point, Dan. I don't Dan. want them involved in that. Yeah. So doing this with little people, it may cost us a million dollars, but I can tell you that it pays off because it costs you a lot more to send a kid to juvie and For a sure. lot more and more to send them to big person. Yeah, jail. and that's yeah. actually a good point. I didn't, I, I didn't really consider, and I'm not suggesting not having them in elementary schools, but I didn't really consider what you just said, that it's more than just about safety. Yeah, the mission is... It's more, yeah, because yeah, they're, re, they're a resource officer, right? Yes. So there's more There's more than just safety. Oh, they do a lot more. So, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I agree with that. So I'm not saying, I, I, I guess I wasn't thinking of it from that perspective, but from that perspective, yes, it makes a lot of sense having elementary schools. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm just, uh, I guess what I was suggesting is potentially looking at where the incidents, the actual safety incidents are happening, not considering what Diane just said, looking at just where the safety things are happening those are in high schools right so my big my, my my point was like thinking through the lens of safety only can we double up on those where the, where the incidents are happening but I, I hear what Diane's saying too Tracy you did say uh, and I want to make sure I wrote this right at all of our middle schools we wouldn't be sharing SROs between buildings no um, so right now and I'll just make sure I have that right so we've got we've got SRO, an SRO at um, Highlands an SRO at um, Park, and an SRO Chinook. at, is that, do Don't we have two right now? Okay, thank you, yeah. 
yeah yeah and then yeah and one one is kind of doing one i mean they, they, that's right. kind of their home bases and i think their one is spending like at now a day at horse seven hills right. but by adding the three we'd have all of the schools covered this yeah. th this plan puts an sro in all high schools and middle schools and it funds these limited commission officers for all the elementary schools plus legacy in phoenix that's right that's correct so okay. this 1.25 million dollars mm -hmm is factored into this plan mm -hmm. and so while the amount is the same as it was in april these are new enhancements that would be included that weren't included in april and the rate is lower and continues to decrease over the three years and to gabe's point the messaging of that and making sure the community knows that that there's money directly going towards that that seems wise to me so we didn't want to point out trying to we don't think we should go over the rate that we did in April. right um if you wanted to add more we'll try to fit it into that amount, that amount uh, just to, you know uh, try to keep it where we were instead of raising it you know maybe we have the, maybe we have the rates that that amounts to the now here they're you know much more reasonable um you know, the taxpayers say, you know, our tax is going up, yeah, the levy amount is going up, but the tax rate, rather than that going up, as it was mm -hmm. in the past couple, of, we've got it going down. Um, it, it just a more reasonable increase, not quite a million dollars each year, meaning a million to 1.5. You know, we've got some things with, uh, with the budget and the other one of the states, so we can, you know, make this look a little better thing for the community. And I know that you can't, um, ever count on money that comes from the state but we're working through the prototypical schools model we're working for more funding for transportation more funding for all of those things more funding federally and statewide for nutrition services so some of the money um, will come from that which then additional funds that are not spent can go to whatever else we need so as you know we repurposed a lot of money right uh, came through the last session and uh, what you're talking about is more money than that. at some point we got to put that money back right you know, to right so another reason to talk to your legislators okay. is this a so i see 24 25 26 is this a three-year like levy option or is this a yes it, so when we get to um so we and we can come back to anything oh, here, oh, but just yes. when we get to so here's sort of the rationale behind okay. that. So back on schedule, so they're on the same. Exactly. Yeah. So um, so f first, uh, Diane alluded to it earlier. I mean, the 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 recommendation from the polling that we did is to to look at, uh, and it's historically what school districts do, a February or April um, um, measure. So that we've got filing timelines here. Um, if we do February, the filing deadline is December 16th. If we do April, um, it's February 24th. I do know that um, Finley is going back out based on what I've told. I don't know if their board has acted yet, but um, I talked to the superintendent there. They're going back out in February. Um, my understanding is that PASCO, I mean, they won't be on the same, you know, county um, ballot but is running a bond and Richland may be running a bond I think that they're still in discussion about that they discussed so, that a lot last night okay <laughs> so there's still um, there there'll be other um, you know neighboring districts with measures in February as well um, so we would um, recommend February in terms of the timing like why three year um, that would get our tech and EP on O levy back on the same timing so it's kind of laid out here uh, if we do a three-year EP&O in February 2023, you know, there's still potential future discussion of a bond and when that's needed, um, then we would, because we obviously wouldn't want all these things coming at the same year. Um, so this would allow us to then get these two on the same four-year track. And if we ran another four-year in February of 2026, then they'd both be up in February of 2030. Okay, so um, just in terms of some next steps, I mean, this is discussion and planning and direction. Uh, and 
there's an, a board meeting coming up October 12th, so if there's some follow up items or additional information or things that you want, we can prepare for that. If we go with that leb, uh, that February timeline, we really need mm -hmm. um, you know a firm like yes approval of the levy amount from the board on October 26th and the levy amount and plan, so we can get the re the resolution prepared. That resolution would then come um, to you on November 9th, so you could take formal action. And remember, we have to appoint the foreign against committee and all those kinds of things. So that would happen November 9th, so we'd be ready by the December timeline. Can so I, there's sorry. just lots more discussion opportunity for you. I have a um, question for our um, levy committee. How will we reconstitute that? Will we? Is there a thought that we could use a professional group to do that? I have had several people ask me that. Well, so I think it's important to just highlight that the the levy committee is a a, um, a different entity right. from the district, separate right. from from the district, and it's a uh, it's run by um, volunteers group, and right. and uh, people who are not district staff members, and so um, you know. I don't know how to answer. That okay, question. so and, and I think that's a good. But I, I'm happy to connect board yeah. members with uh, members of the Citizens Levy Committee, uh, and I, I think that that members of the Citizens Levy Committee would welcome having you know conversations with board members and and that kind of a thing. I, I mean, I think it was not for me. It was community people didn't understand um, the 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 not connection. The, that how the committee is not connected to the district, like you said, a separate entity, and they wanted to know. I and I like we think there's a lot of information out there because we see all of it, but a lot of people didn't think that they saw a lot of information, or maybe it wasn't the information they wanted to see. I'm not quite sure. And so the person who said that um, comes from back east, where school boards are also the city councils or the village council, and um, they said, oh, that's always done professionally by a, I don't know, media company or something like that. And so I didn't answer them, so I thought I'd bring that to you. Okay. Yeah, so... Um there's really two campaigns that are typically run when there's a ballot measure. Uh, there's an informational campaign, and that's the campaign that the district can run. So what we can do is we can present facts and information in all kinds of ways, through meetings, through, we can do one mailer a year um, in that levy cycle. That's the PDC rules. We can hold meetings. We can, we can do all kinds of things to provide information. We can't try to persuade people to to vote in favor. You can't use taxpayer dollars or taxpayer time to do that. I could, outside of my job, I can volunteer um, with a group <laughs> that does that, just like board members can, just like staff members can, and of course any citizen that's not connected with the district. So there is a citizens levy committee that's been in place for a, a, a number of years, long time I believe, and they um, work to do more of a promotional mm -hmm. campaign. And um, that's typical of districts in our state. You know, in my old district, there was a citizens levy committee and that's what they did. They, I mean, they, they, you know, tried to, based on good sound information, persuade people to vote yes. Um, and they, they can do that. They are the group that put out signs and do those kinds of things. I wasn't even aware of, of this committee, but yeah. Oh. What's that? I wasn't even aware There's of this committee. Yeah, they came and spoke with us. And they were the ones who put on the thing where we had the one gentleman come to the one that I came. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I think that this is a great conversation and that awareness of how this these different campaigns work, the informational campaign of the district and the work of the Citizens Levy Committee is great. And I think, you know, board members just can can volunteer their time, mm -hmm. too, to to be a part of that work, um, just like staff members under I mean, you've got to all follow the PDC rules yeah, and all those kind say. of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm happy to help make those connections or um, answer those questions. It would be possible, just to, to kind of close the loop on that, it would be possible for the district to hire somebody um, to work with our communications department to help do the information mailer or something like that. Like we could hire that out. Again, it's information. Um, it would be possible for a, a citizens levy committee to hire somebody to do something as well. Um, 
on the promotional side. It's just two separate, you know, entities and two separate pots of money and really two separate purposes. Thank you. Okay, if you guys have any other questions? So I think the question is, so where do we go from here? So we need to talk about, so you, we don't need a levy amount now, but we need to talk about uh, levy amounts in. I think we kind of need, we, we kind of need your sense. We need some direction. We need your responses to what do you think about scenario A, scenario B? Are there different scenarios that you want us to pursue? And, you know, we, we need your direction. So on the summary that you gave, um, when I'm reading through that, there's like two two points that kind of stuck out to me. And um, and then your question is, we have two different plans, right? We have plan A and plan B. And it's like, which plan should we kind of go go with? But well, my, my thing is, are we going to address those points from that survey? If we don't address them, I think we go with plan B or plan A. I think if we could successfully address them, then we go with plan B or plan B. That's, that's my opinion. And can you, um, the points from the survey? Yes, yeah, so you sent out two survey re results, you know, uh, documents to today. Right. The or, demographic. Yeah, the demo. There's yeah, one demographics ago, and there was another one. Yeah, th these and then I don't the know if it was it wasn't this, so it must have been the other one. OK. Yeah, I don't know if you have that one handy, but on well, the very last page, I wish I, I took remember when I walked in, I said I wish I brought my laptop. This is why um, when they talked about why you should run it at certain times. Yes. What yes. groups of people or ages are yep. more apt to vote? Yes, no. Yeah. And the first cetera. the first bullet point was talking about um, the tax rate and the conservatives, essentially. Right, and those are the those their their big feedbacks, and and that's and everything that I've talked to, I don't know, probably several hundred people, and they always tell me the same thing. It's like over and over again. They they say the same thing. They say, you have, we have this tax that that we have, and when we pay for this, what are we paying for? Because what I feel, what the, what these the conservative people feel is that they have this woke indoctrination coming in from the from Olympia. And the board, it really isn't standing up to that it could, by representing the community. The community has a thought, you know, and the board really isn't representing the community thoughts. That's why we, when Gabe talks about passing policies, I think like that that policy we passed that goes a long way to satisfying that community because their 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 question is, when I pay for this tax, what am I getting for that? Are you guys actually representing me? Are you fighting the things that I'm against that are coming into our schools? And that's what I keep hearing. I've heard that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. I think that's why that policy made such waves. It was national news, um, still is to some extent. And um, and I know that, that I got a lot of people were really grateful that we passed that. And I think there's a couple more things we can do like that that will help that group. And I think we passed the levy easy, just like we've always have. It's my opinion. Okay. Oh, no, I was going to say, I, I tried looking a little bit too, but I couldn't find what the. In what you sent out. I could find it. No, I have it. I'm just writing. Yeah. It was the second group. It was the 360. Mm -hmm. I think you're referring to a chart. It had like two columns, like some on the left, some on the right. Well, and at the very bottom, then it had yeah. like a couple of two, three sentence. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a lot of this is going to come down to messaging. Like we've, I think we've done some stuff, positive stuff in regards to, I think where we, you know, potentially wanted to go. So I think it's, it's, it's messaging that information. And so I'm talking about creating policies and then messaging those policies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're, you must have read that book. You're not old enough, but the the massage is the message. It was the name of that book. Um, so you need to know 
or, or, or you want some guidance at least for now uh, as to where can, can financially we we're thinking. What you think is going to pass. Okay. And considering the amount. Yeah. Can I read it? The, ink, the conclusion. Several factors made the Kenwick School District a challenging environment. First, the inflation hitting hard the, the working class areas of the Kenwick harder. Second, many conservatives, especially working class conservatives, have become more skeptical of public schools in recent years. And Kenwick is, uh, is a rather conservative district. Overall, areas like Kenwick are a tough spot. So there's like two issues, right? There's the tax rate with the economy, and then there's the conservative group that has been lost. And so I think address I think you address those two two issues. You know, we we discuss and we say, okay, how can we talk about each one? We're, we've talked about the tax one a lot, and it's a lot of good ideas there. And there's there's another one according to the survey. Those are the conclusions, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I, th I found it. You're reading off the conclusions where it says the bad news yeah. demographically. Right. Yes. This is a difficult yep. district. The good news. The second bullet says the good news voting patterns are less tied to into partisanship than in most districts. And there's a recent history of strong overperformance. Um, Kennewick may be conservative, but Kennewick schools have a proven record of receiving yes votes from conservative voters. Our analysis shows a weaker than expected correlation with partisan elections. Mm -hmm. And then it says overall the 22 levy results likely represent a reasonable baseline estimate around 50%. So, I mean, it's also just, I think, kind of what districts, including ours, kind of what we can sort of expect is around yeah. 50, and that's 50 where we were, you know. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we were right at there. Um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, the, the next one talks about, uh, you know, working class voters and, and the economy and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just the disparities of income within mm -hmm. the community. Um, and um, some outreach to, to voters. Um, so socioeconomic status is a factor. Again, that kind of plays into, I think, the amounts and tax rates and things like that. And there's also, they said other demographic analysis like age were normal. Um, that 2022 levies underperformed across the board, which we know is looking at other districts. Um, and you know, get out the vote efforts people mentioned. So some, so this is more like on kind of demographics and and strategy and messaging right. and those kind of things. Yep, they talk about yeah. bridge, bu uh, building a bridge with the community. You know that they've they've kind of have a hit on. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I actually yeah. agree with that. Yeah. That's because everybody, the people I talk to, that's all. That's what they tell me. And yeah. it, you know, I thought what it showed again is what I was talking about. Um, those who don't vote are as important as those who vote no. And so getting, not to say the people who vote yes aren't important, that's not what I meant, but those who don't vote, it, it skew it. And so somehow, you know, you talk about get out the vote, whatever we can do. Um, you know, good schools make good communities, mm -hmm. right? And um, the joke always is as you get older, those kids that you see in school are coming into school, those are going to be your doctors and your nurses and your whomever when you get old and you want good people to do that. And we want strong, healthy communities, which are well-educated communities. So I'm not sure that partisanship plays um, as much a role in wanting good things for our community. And we also bring more people to our community when we have good schools. People specifically look at that and they don't always go to some places. Absolutely. So from my point of view, uh, I would, I, th I think we come up with a couple of good things. First off, I think our first round of asks on the levy rates for, you know, earlier this year were too high. I think that been in looking back, I think our, our ask was too high. And I think it, it was it was a it was a stretch. So again, so that's on us. And we learned, and I think now that we're looking at this, we've got some new numbers that we can then pres present and go forward. That I think show a good effort. You know that hey, we listened, we understand, we're going to do less, we're going to lower some stuff. I think we've got some good positions here where we're looking at safety. We want to make safety a big issue. We want to push on that. Um, and I think that having a you know. Uh, Basically, a declining uh, levy rate over those three years, I think, is also a good good program as well. 
Um, I believe that we should go again, go with this February, the February program. I think the one, you know, look at this 176 or 175 or whatever, you know, some number there that we can go on. I think that's, I think that's gonna show hopefully good faith effort on our part with the community. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to go from there, you know, and work on the messaging specifically with safety and some of this other stuff. I, I agree with what Mike said. I and the, the numbers I think are important, certainly, and the fact that it's lower and it's decreasing. I just think that getting that information out about why those numbers are what they are and what they include. Um, I just had somebody ask me yesterday at a meeting um, who is a person who I thought would know these things. So tell me, what does the levy pay for? The person is an employee of the district and um, I, I so I said as many things as I could think of, and I said tomorrow night we're going to talk about that. But that's on our district website, and but that's not where everybody goes. That's what our information showed us. So how do we get that information about the whys of what that is and the hows, how that will be used for our students? I think that's the most important piece of information to get out there. That'll solve half of it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm. I guess I'm, I would follow Mike and agree that I like this piece with the safety factored in. Um, I, I think that's where I would look to go forward. Um, again, I would just, I, I think messaging is going to be completely important. I, I, I kind of, I think, disagree with you in a sense, Mike, that I think the levy rates, I think if other stuff would have been done, I don't think the levy rates would have been a problem. Um, personally, I think if um some things potentially were done a little bit different during that time i mean obviously we don't have masks we don't have lockdowns that stuff's gone now hopefully for good um, but i think if, if we did some stuff a little bit different i think the levy would have passed it what we had it the first time initially um but now i think i think now we have to make sure we have the, the right message and and what some of that stuff we've we've heard from the community we've addressed um specifically safety I think is huge. So we just, how do we message that for all groups of the community to see what we've Are we've there done. more messages that you're hearing that? Oh, I mean, the ones I've, I mean, the ones I've shared tonight. So I think we, I just, I don't know how to wordsmith that or how to. I think that. there's a couple policies we could work on and, and address, you know, the, we have the 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 flag, the controversial issues. We have some 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 subjects like that that keep coming up. I think addressing those and doing just like we did with the with the last policy, a little workshop where we can work through those issues and all come to an agreement and, and get a five, hopefully a five zero vote or something like that. I think that would be really beneficial and and showing people that we're listening. I think it actually I, I actually think it's it's essential. I think it has to happen to pass. I think. Okay. What about timing? Yeah, mm, that's one. The information that was in there talks about why February would be yeah, the most opportune time. Yeah, that last um, that what last bullet point on that page that Mike was referring to recommends yeah. February or April, and given that other districts are going out. In a, in February, and um, just given the urgency, you know, of the situation, we, we think mean, February is a good. Yeah, I, I think February too. I we we've got some months to get get stuff get stuff done, get the word out, message. I mean, I think that's fine. There were pros and cons to to February, but um, my personal opinion is we need to know soon what what we're looking at and if you um, you know I hate to say this but if you do need to run it again or if it's not happening um, then there's more time and it's not a as big a shock if we have to make horrendous cuts which I I don't even want to say that but at least you're not making it in May well, I mean, and, and, well, I'm. I'm, I'm no, I, I am very positive. 
RIF notice well, yeah, deadlines yeah, and things there, like there that. Yeah, there are RIF notices that are in May. Yeah. And so there are things that legally you have to know about. And I, you know, like I truly believe that this is so important, but um, there are just policies and procedures that have to happen. And so um, one way or the other, we have to either be able to hire more teachers back or and more staff back. And that takes time too. You can't do if you do that in June, you don't get the best people always. And so there are lots of things that early, earliness on this makes a big difference on. I, I think statistically February is extremely more likely to pass than the other months. I think as time goes on, it's less likely. Yeah. So well, and he gave pros and cons to that, yeah. but yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Final, final February, as long as we as long as we do something to to work on that that group we've lost. You know, I think we just we work on that group that we've lost and I think the February is fine. Well, we've got the yeah, we've, we've got to swing 300 people. Yeah, and so and new voters crazy. too, you know, people yeah. who didn't vote, who may time. not have thought it was that important at that time, but who may now think, oh my gosh, look what happened. I didn't vote. And so those are the people that also you want to make sure you say that's important that you participate in that. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize what I think we're hearing. <laughs> so, so we we um, have the direction. So, I'm hearing that the board likes the scenario B mm -hmm. um, scenario that includes the additional safety um, staffing, and that you know that gives us, I think, enough for us to go back and just crunch numbers and make sure you know and that the board you know that likes the february timing so we would start planning for that and that um you know that really this gives us also if we know this is the direction that we're heading we can start with our our messaging i mean we can't you know, I, I mean, just our pl our messaging right. plan. I mean, obviously, we're not going to start talking. We don't do anything until the board <laughs> passes the resolution and and that kind of thing. We're not going to get out in front of the board, but we can start certainly planning for our communications plan and how we're going to, um, you know, message things, ensure people have good understanding of all of this, what methods of communication we're going to use, all those kind of things. So with scenario B, that includes the um, the officers at the elementary school. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. So the funding for that. Funding for that. And then of course, you know, just yes, it includes the funding for that. And then, you know, we just have to get the plan that, and work with the that was the <laughs> second part KPD of my question. Yeah. On the recruiting and all those kind of things to actually make it happen. This this provides the funding right. for it to happen. And then we can, you know, and we can start to do some preliminary things. I mean they were very, very um you know, positive about that there are people out there and we could make this happen. And they, that million dollars that we put into that, was that the amount? Mm -hmm. Okay. Was um, that, that pays all of their um, expense or all of their salary, correct? It's not, we don't go part with KPD. Yeah, no, there was, you know, uh, they're not, I mean, the city's really they can't focused go out and do on the work. partnership right. on the SRO part. Right. So that does assume that they, they're going to, be able to come up with their half of the funding, but it sounded like they were really planning for that in their biennial budget. Thank but you. this part would be all us. us. They would partner for us with training and so forth. And then, what's that? Yeah, so that's the main the R cost. Correct. The R rents. And are those bargaining unit positions or how are they hired? We, yeah. You know, we, we, the, um, since they're retired, they're already part of a retirement system. They're part of they're LOAF, left, though. You know, yeah, so, so it's different. Um, that's uh, we'd have to work through because kind of I'm all thinking of those that's details. more that's more money then, depending on if they're bargaining unit or if they're off salary or off scale yeah. or whatever. So I just was wondering if there's more money tied to that actually. Um, well, in terms of bargaining unit, they're retired. Right. Right. But then they would come in. To ours, if, and then you'd have to pay benefits. Okay, so those are some things I kind of like to know about too, because that's additional funds. I mean, not that I don't think it's great. I agree, but that'd be more funds. So, 
so kind of on the same note, not, I'm not sure if this is possible, but I, I mean, safety is of utmost importance. Is this something that we could kick the bush on right now and with COVID funds potentially? I know we'd have to talk about it. Yeah. I just, is this something that we, rather than wait until the levy runs and, and all this kind of planning down the road, is this something we can kind of kick around to see it's it's not in the budget for this year. You I mean, can't pull COVID relief funds to I mean, cover I think it. We, be, we and and we can't, it. you know, we can't, that's not a revenue stream like a levy, right? So it would just be, I, I don't I don't know until we were sure that the levy passed and that we had the commitment and the funding. Like, I think, you know, as soon as the levy passes, we could move forward knowing that that money's coming in. But I, I, I'd be very uncomfortable I think trying to put the cart before the horse when we don't have a funding stream to actually do it. So ESSER funds wouldn't cover it? We're using ESSER funds right to just for as part of this plan right it, it already assumes use of 10 to 15 million in ESSER funds. Yeah I mean ESSER could not directly that um, qualify but you know, could, could we do it with with money, you know? Yeah, but the point she makes about the doesn't pass and you struggle with it. And you know, That's right. Sign a contract, you're out of luck. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the other option would be for the board, you know, like next year, say, the, I mean, if, well, if the levy didn't pass, we'd be cutting, you know, $10 million out of the budget. You could cut $11 million out of the budget and then add a million, you know, I mean, but so you'd have to cut. We still have staff that positions <laughs> And you, just to remind everybody too, when we go back to what is the levy, you know, what is current levy? But I mean, if we had a levy, I just want to highlight this again, because I think it's really important. You know, we're already using levy dollars mm -hmm. that we don't have right now, right? To fund our current school resource officers and current security personnel and nurses and counselors and, and you know, 4.6 million. So we'd be adding you know, to this column when it comes to health and safety to get these new additions, but we're, you know, we're already funding <laughs> people using fund balance in ESSER because we don't have that levy coming in. So, so that, pro that program would, would start in the, if with the levy passed, that program would start in the fall of 23 there would be that there would be it would be staffed and there would be people <laughs> so, in those yeah. positions I, mean, I, I know you want me to say yes so <laughs> but I, let me, I just want but I, I know want. but let me tell just <laughs> let me answer it kind of realistically so if we know if the if the levy passes in February then we know we've got the funding and we can move forward so then it would be okay let's get the plan together let's get the job description together let's in earnest you know work i mean we can have the job description together and things like that we can do preliminary planning but it's kind of like with a bond right you you might do some upfront work but you don't start construction on the project until the bond passes so but as soon as the bond as soon as the levy passes in february we can start putting all the groundwork in. I can't guarantee you that by fall we'll be able to recruit and hire 18 people. I mean, I wish I could, but we, we, we're we gonna, you know, I, that's the part that I just can't guarantee. But you can begin the process and start moving Absolutely, I mean, we would be, we could have all of our ducks in a row and then as soon as we know it passes, we can start getting the positions posted and getting the people, you know, recruited. And talking with KPD, you know, it, it sounds like they, you know, they said, yeah, there are people out there. We were confident that the people are out there. I, yeah, I just don't, I just don't want the the levy pass and then we can't fill that safety role. Like we're going to message until 2024 or later, or it just, we just, it just yeah. doesn't happen. That's why I'm asking yeah. or was asking if we can, we can kick the bush a little bit on this this year and just be, <laughs> again, I, I just think it's so important, but we're, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, you know, I can also follow up on, I don't, I don't know the timing of the biennial budget for the city of Kennewick, um, because that's the other piece on the SROs. So, you know, I don't know if it, it I'm just trying to think the if there's, if they get their, you know, when, when or is their funding yeah. going to come through for that? 
to make sure we can start moving on the SRO piece. I mean, I share the same interest of we want to get it in there and we, you know, I mean, we would do everything within our power to get the people hired and placed. <clears throat> Just worries me, I guess, for us to be talking about adding things without the security of knowing that the funding is going to be in place because then the board's going to be put in a position of turning around and making 10 million of cuts. And I just, I think it worries me. I don't want the board to have to be in that position because well, I just don't know how you would manage it. And committing funds when the, you're not sure of the funds yet is irresponsible I think. I also think it gives the voters, it gives parents in the community the opportunity to say yeah this is important to us and we we you know we we want to pay for this because um, that's what yeah. we're asking them to do. Yeah and I, I'm my suggestion is is more along the lines of if we're kicking it around now and we're making plans for it and we're like that's showing the community that it's a priority for us as well mm -hmm. instead of waiting you know saying we're going to wait until february and wait for the, the date of the vote like what are what are the initial stuff we're doing can we reach out and see can the can can chief or the department reach out and say hey like is this of interest to you and then they can say yeah you know we've had yeah. 40 people show interest so at least we know like yeah, we can you know we can get and, and get it going quick that way we can we yeah, can move gotcha. like that like so said, we're it's ready like to getting the design and architect yeah. plans ready to do the build and and we've yeah. already started that groundwork yeah. right um in, in Chief Guerrero's already done some research on um, the retirement system and left and how that would work. So we've already, you know, we don't want to put it out there as we didn't want to put it out there even for the board to discuss if it wasn't a feasible option. And, and right. you know, we were on board. And so I think, you know, now if it's, yeah, it's going to be part of the plan, we can continue that preliminary planning. So we're ready to ready to go when the levy passes. Okay, any other thoughts or comments? Pretty cool, right? Tracy, thank you. Thank you very much for Thanks, your Vic. information. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, all right, guys. Uh, next on the agenda here is our next meeting agenda. Uh, currently, we have strategic goal report. Uh, we have two strategic goal reports. Uh, for enrollment and capital projects, uh, another one on knowing that all students are state and valued. Uh, we're also going to talk about policies protecting against discrimination and ensuring safe environments. And then we're and if you recall, I know Mr. Mabry is not here, but that was a request of Mr. Mm -hmm. Mabry to have a discussion about that on the agenda. Yeah, okay. so. mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, and then we're going to cap it off with another fun executive session for more legal information and we can kind of put p potential on that this was our regularly scheduled um quarterly meeting given that we had exec session for legal tonight we'll kind of see what is needed and it may we may or may not need it at that october time okay. and then i'd like to make an addition please so um was a general assembly is um day after tomorrow friday and saturday and so um just if we can, I'll do a quick review or give provide you with the information because then we'll have to um, a few days after that we'll have to re redo our priorities that we already did because they'll come from General Assembly and then we'll redo those and get them in for the November one. Okay. Was a General Assembly wrap up? Yep. Okay. Anything else, Gabe, Micah? Okay, if not. We're going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.